Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. Man, good word. That was awesome. You know, God is, he's such a good and faithful God. It's awesome that he still chooses to use us, even though we're not perfect, even though we make mistakes. We uh, do things sometimes that we're just like, look back on and go, what in the world? (laughs) Why would I do or say something like that? And he still, he still called us in spite of us, you know, because he is enough. He's more than enough. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, the title of my message is Change God's Mind. And uh, I know probably at least half of you are going, this dude, (laughs) change God's mind, huh? All right, that's interesting. Well, I thought it was pretty interesting too. Let's just, uh, let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, Help us to change your mind through your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 15, verse 22. Matthew 15, verse 22. This was something I was reading the other day, and it just kind of jumped out at me. Well, I wanted to bring it up with you guys. It also tells the same story in Mark. And there's just some very minute differences. But, uh, but it is still exactly the same. I would encourage you to go check it out in Mark as well. But uh, for the sake of the teaching this morning, we're going to read this one. So this is Jesus. He just got done with with uh, teaching, and and um, he was trying to just go find kind of a quiet place. He wanted to get away and and just have some time alone. However, if you know anything about Jesus and his ministry, whenever you go around healing a bunch of people and you know casting out demons and things like that, you don't get a whole lot of personal time. This is one of those cases where he wasn't getting much personal time. So it says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to, a, to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now this crying that it mentions here um, may be some actual tears, but it's more likely that she was she was being loud. She was crying out to him uh, to get his attention. Have mercy on me, O Lord. So she calls him Lord, and then she says, Son of David. So she recognizes who he is. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. She's demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. Poor guys, they were getting a little annoyed at this point. He answered, he answers her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came in front of him, and she knelt down before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, is it, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, yes, Lord. She recognized what he was saying. She agreed with what he was saying. And then she says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Man, there's some, there's some really interesting things in this. 
This woman, she wasn't from the house of Israel. She wasn't an Israelite. She lived in a Greek town. And she just heard that Jesus was coming in town. Word gets around, right? And she has a little girl that is possessed by a demon. And she, she goes to the only one that can do anything about it. The only one who can help her daughter. Has any parent in here ever had a child going through something that, that you couldn't personally take care of? You couldn't deal with on your own? Isn't it a hopeless feeling? It's a helpless feeling. You feel, you feel absolutely chained and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, she found that one drop of hope. That one drop of hope. Someone said, Jesus is here. And she immediately gets up and goes. And she's crying out to him. She recognizes who he is, his authority. She declares who he is, calls him Lord and son of David. A lot of people didn't even call him son of David because they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to come in agreement with him being possibly the Messiah, and the Messiah had to come from the line of David. She did recognize that, though. And even though she did, she's continually crying out for him. She's continually yelling for him to get his attention, and he doesn't answer her. He doesn't respond at all. That, to me, I'm like, my Jesus did that? My, my God did that? And then he lays it out and says, I'm here for the children of Israel first. Which this kind of struck me odd. Because if you go back in John, it specifically talks about where he heals uh, the centurion's servant, I believe it was. And that centurion was Greek. He was Roman. He was a Roman soldier. And he healed that guy's kid and said, I haven't found any faith greater than that. But why did he heal that guy's kid? Because of his faith. And the same thing happens here with this woman. But it just blows my mind that Jesus' disciples have spent so much time with Jesus, and he's teaching them to love one another, to care for one another. He's even sent them out to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to do all these things. And here they are, annoyed that this woman has a demon-possessed child, and they just want to send her away. It really frustrates me sometimes. It really frustrates me. But we have hindsight, right? We get to look back at what was going on. These guys are living it, so I can't judge them too much. But they're asking him, send her away. Jesus straight up tells her that he's not going to do it. Because that's not why he's here. And she says, that's not good enough. And he's, he's like, well... I'm here to feed the children of Israel. And she says, even the dogs, she understood, even the dogs. Basically, he was calling her and her lineage dogs because that was very typical of the time. She acknowledges that, acknowledges her place, and still says, even the dogs get to lick up the crumbs off the children's plates that fall from the table. And Jesus says, Good point. He made his stand. She countered. And because of her faith, he said, good point. It's done. So, there's a couple verses that talk about God not changing his mind. And so a lot of people stand on these two verses, two verses in particular. But the two verses that they stand on, I'm sorry I didn't write them down. I should have. These two verses, they're talking about God not changing his mind about this specific situation that that verse is talking about. So it's the content and the context. 
right, putting them together. But there is time after time after time where God relents, where God changes his mind. Let me take you to probably what I feel is the most important verses that we can go over that discuss this. Please turn with me to Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. I would highly recommend that you underline this or you highlight it or something in your Bible. Do something that draws your attention to this because it is a word that you can stand on. I'm going to give you some examples afterward, but we'll go ahead and read through this. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. There's no question about where this came from. It came from the Lord. And the Lord tells Jeremiah, Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So, Jeremiah went. He says, I went to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. It was, it was not perfect. The clay that the potter was working with was not perfect. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, here's, here's the key, and if that nation, I warned, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider. I will reconsider the good I have intended to do for it. The Lord is saying this. The Lord said this to him. He says, I can have these plans, but if you do this, then I'm going to do this. If you don't do this, I'm going to do this. He says, these are my plans, but you can change those plans by your actions and the way that you respond to my plans. Do, have any of you ever felt helpless? As in, you felt like it didn't matter what you did. That God's plan was already done and didn't matter. Like, this is, this is a done deal. No matter what I do, it doesn't make any difference. I'm telling you, this came straight out of the Word of God. This came out of His mouth. He says, I will reconsider. I have a plan, but I will reconsider it. I'm going to go through a few different verses and just kind of give you some examples here. You can turn to them if you want, but you don't have to. The first one that I'm going to go to is Genesis 6, 6 through 9. Genesis 6, 6. This is the story of Noah. <clears throat> the Lord had created all of humankind. And it's at 6, verse 6, it says, And then the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. He created man, yet their actions were so wicked that he regretted making them. And he chose to start over again. So he did start over again, didn't he? 
How about the Tower of Babel? This is in Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, but I will kind of paraphrase. But God said, let us go down there. God is talking in His counsel and says, let us go down there. This is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing will be impossible for them. All the people, they all spoke one language, and they all started to turn a little wicked. And they got together and said, let's build this cool big tower that's going to take us all the way up into heaven. And we're like, what about the ozone layer, you know? Like, this might not work out so well for you. But God says that they are all of one people. They're all of one tongue. We're going to go down and do something about this because if we don't, there's nothing they won't be able to accomplish. There's a lot you can get out of this story. But the one point that I want to make is the fact that God had created them this way, but because of their actions, He decided... He saw what they were doing and then decided to go down and do something about it and change things up. This was when he decided it. Genesis 18, Sodom and Gomorrah. You guys know this one. Sodom and Gomorrah were so disgusting. Their sin was so vile that God decided to go down he himself and two other angels decided to go down and wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. Wipe it off the face of the earth. But thank God for Abraham. Because he asked God, he starts having this conversation with him. The first time, you know, he's probably like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try the water here and ask God, God, let me ask you something. If there's, if there's 50 people, are you going to wipe out the whole place for these 50? He's like, no, no, I won't. And he's like, okay, good. Whew. But then he wants to step back in. Well, what about, what about if there's this many? And then he keeps doing with this with God. He's playing this, not playing this game, but he's pretty, he's pretty worried at this point, you know, he's like, man, I know there's probably not 50 that are, are good in that city, but my cousin lives there. You know, I don't want him and his family to burn. And God, he just keeps talking him down, talking him down until there's what, 10 left or something like that. God says, fine, if there's 10, yeah, I'll spare it. But he gets there and realizes that there's not 10 and he's going to wipe it out anyway. But he does change his mind and let Lot and his family leave. There's a good chance Lot and his family would have been caught up in that whole deal anyway. But he changes his mind. Because Abraham decided to stand up and ask God, please, please at least spare them. And he does. He changed God's mind. How about Jonah? Jonah is one of my favorite stories about this, not because of the miraculous work that God did, not because God kept Jonah alive in a whale or a huge fish, probably a whale, not, not because of that, but the reason I like it so much is because Jonah's reaction to all this, Jonah's a little dense, really if you think about it. And he tries to get away from God. God causes this huge storm, and these dudes throw him over, and he gets swallowed by a whale, and the whale takes him straight to where God told him to go anyway, spits him out on the shore. He's got to be thinking, wow, that's miraculous. You know, <laughs> that's, that's a miracle. And you know what, Jonah, you're right, it is a miracle. But then he goes into Nineveh, and he declares... If you don't repent in 40 days, this place is getting overrun. And he knows they're not going to repent. 
These guys are wicked, they're sick, they're twisted. They're not going to repent, so I'm going to tell them. Then I'm going to go up on this hill, I'm going to sit there and watch. He wants to watch the destruction of Nineveh. He probably had some personal beef against somebody there. Somebody there had done something wrong to him, and he got offended. So he wants to see this place burn. And so he goes up, and he sits there, and God brings a little bit of shade for him. And then God knows what's in Jonah's heart, right? And so God takes that shade away, and and Jonah starts getting all kinds of upset and bent out of shape, and he's like, I didn't want to tell them because I knew you would forgive them. Just let it burn. And God's like, no, that's not my plan. And God doesn't let it burn. Jonah's like, you might as well kill me now. If you're going to let them live, just take me. God's like, it's coming soon enough. <laughs> you know? You're not going to live forever, dude. You're going to die. Don't worry. But they repented. God was going to destroy Nineveh. He was going to let it be overrun. But the king, word got to the king. And the king declared a fast for everybody, not just for people. He said, you can't even feed your animals. Don't feed anybody. Nobody's going to eat. The king put on sackcloth. He put on very uncomfortable clothes and repented. And God saw that humility, saw that he repented, saw that he had a true change of heart, so God had a change of heart. God used Nineveh later. God even talks about it later in the Word. But because of their change of heart, because of their repentance, he changed his mind. I love that. 2 Kings verse 20, or chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. This is King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a great king, honestly. He was a phenomenal king. But God told the prophet Isaiah to go tell King Hezekiah that he's about to die. He was even a good king. So God was warning him, go tell the king he's about to die. He says, okay. So he goes and tells him. Isaiah was troubled because he loved the king. He goes and he tells him, and the king turned his back from Isaiah and started crying out and reminding God of his faithfulness to God, reminding God that he loved him and that God loved him. At this point, Isaiah turns to leave. He's walking out. He's out of the middle court, it said. And God said, Isaiah, stop. Go back and tell him. I'll give him 15 more years. And he gives him 15 more years. God just said, go tell him that he's going to die. And he did. But because of King Hezekiah's actions, God changed his mind. If King Hezekiah wouldn't have done that, he would have just died. He would have. But that wasn't okay with him. He wasn't ready. So God let him live. So, the next one I'd like to visit is Exodus chapter 3. Actually, I think it may be chapter 4, 24 through 26. Sorry, I've got one thing printed and then another thing written under it. So it's in either 3 or 4, but it's verse 24 through 26. And this is after Moses had already met with God at the burning bush. I know I've, I've told this before for kind of a different reason, but this story, it just stands out to me so much because no one ever preaches on it. No one ever teaches on it. I don't think I've ever heard a teaching on it other than my own. But if you read through it, he's already been told by God to go to Egypt and set his people free. While he's on his way, while he's on his way, the Lord met him 
It says, and sought to put him to death. God just told Moses, go, set my people free. This is what I want you to tell them. This is what I want you to do. He answers all of Moses' questions and his belly aches and his concerns about what he should or shouldn't do or say or shouldn't say and how he can't talk. And, and God answers all these, these things for him. But he's on his way. And his wife, God shows up. It says, he met him there and sought to put him to death. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, man, you know what? I changed my mind. You're dying. I'm going to kill this guy. I'm going to pick somebody else. And, uh, but Moses' wife, she's there and she steps in. And it says that she takes a sharp flint, circumcises their son, rubs the blood from the circumcision on Moses' feet as a, as a um, blood covenant. And God respected that. And God let Moses live because of the sacrifice from his wife. And God chose to not put him to death. God changed his mind. It says right here, he sought to put him to death. But he changed his mind because of his wife. Thank you, God. That's, that's significant. That is super significant. The point is God changed his mind. In John 2, verses 1 through 12, I love the story. It's the story of Jesus' very first miracle. He's just stepping into his ministry. And he's going to a party probably a fairly good party because they ran out of wine pretty early. And Jesus' mother comes to him and says, hey, they're out of wine. And he's like, what's that have to do with me, woman? I think that the terminology was probably a little more respectful, but that's what it says in the word, woman. What does this have to do with me? I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say that to my mom. <laughs> the outcome would have been a little different. He says, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come, he says. It's not time for me to do anything. And she pays no attention to what he just said, and she looks at them, at the servants, and says, do whatever he says. A couple things to pick up on here. Jesus was obedient to the Father, even though the word says that he doesn't do, he didn't do anything that the father didn't tell him to do, didn't say anything that the father didn't tell him to say. But does the word not say, honor your father and mother, for this is good, and you will live a long life. He gives a, a, a command, and he gives a promise with it. So even though God didn't tell him to turn the water into wine, God did tell him to honor his father and mother, and he was honoring his mother at this point, and even though he straight up says, it's not my time, God says, well, now it is your time, because your mom said so. And he's like, okay. And he tells them what to do. He changes his mind, because his mom had pity on them and wanted them to not be disgraced in front of everyone. And so he's like, Fine, it's going to be the best wine you've ever tasted in your whole life. Make it happen. And so they do, and he did, and it was. But he changed his mind because someone stood in for him, because someone told him to. Someone asked him to. He pretty much told him, and he obeyed. I don't recommend that you tell him what to do, but I do recommend that you ask. If you need something changed, or if you want something changed, then ask. Then ask. The Word says that if you believe, if you believe, and if you, if you keep my commands and you believe, anything that you ask in my name will be given to you. This is Jesus speaking. 
There's a lot in that. And you got to process it, you got to digest it, but you got to believe and you got to be willing to do what he says. His commands, follow his commands. Love one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do what I ask you to do when I ask you to do it. And there's nothing that you can ask me that I won't do for you, that the Father won't do for you whenever you ask in my name. That's huge. It also tells us that if you don't receive, keep on asking. Keep on asking. If you are lined up with his word and you're seeking his face and you are diligently seeking his face and you are willing to follow him to the ends of the earth and back no matter what it is, then keep on asking. You can change God's mind. I just gave you several examples and there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more, guys. He delights in giving us the desires of our heart. He wants you to have the desires of your heart. He wants you to be able to operate in his power and walk in his power, in his strength, in his might because he's going to get the glory for it and more people are going to come in just like whenever Jesus is trying to get away and have some alone time. He can't and then he has compassion on people. The greatest example of that is right after his um, cousin John got his head cut off and he goes over to the other side of the lake because he's He's got to weep. He's got to, to process this. But everybody sees him, and he has compassion on them. He's loving them still. Doesn't, he's not looking out for his own best interest. He's looking out for their interest, and they're coming, and they're asking him to change their circumstances. They weren't coming just to sit there and look at him. Because wherever he went, he healed people. He cast out demons. He changed their circumstances because they came and asked, and he changed their circumstances. Isn't that awesome? But if your circumstances aren't changing, keep asking. Keep asking. I want to ask you a quick question. What is answered prayer? Think about it. What is answered prayer? It's God changing his mind. It's God changing his mind. Think about the crippled dude that was crippled, or not crippled, blind, I'm sorry. The guy that was blind, and his, his disciples asked him, they said, why is, he, why is he blind? He was born blind. Why? Was it because of his sins or his parents' sins? And Jesus says, neither. It was for me to get the glory. It was for God to get glory. Isn't that amazing? But would the guy ever have become uh, able to see if he wouldn't have cried out and asked? So many people just let God just go right on by. They don't even ask because they don't feel like that they deserve it. They don't feel like they're worthy. They feel like God doesn't love them enough. They feel like God's not going to do it, because why would he? It's just me. <laughs> He's going to, so he can get the glory. So you can fill the kingdom of heaven with people that otherwise wouldn't be there. That's why. God wants to rain down love and affection on you. He wants to rain down gifts on you says he will open up the floodgates of heaven. He will pour down on you. <laughs> That's just amazing if you do something. He says, give and it will be given unto you. Give and it will be given unto you. You got to do something first and then it's going to happen. Ask him and he will change his mind. I have a, a personal example of that. Um, one of my daughters was struggling and uh, going through some really hard stuff. And Brittany and I, we got to a place where, you know, our, our hands were tied. There was nothing we could do about it. And we knew it as far as us physically. 
We couldn't be good enough parents. We couldn't discipline more. We couldn't discipline less. We couldn't tell her what to do or not to do, and that would change everything. We knew. We had tried pretty much everything. So we got together, and we prayed, and we anointed each other with oil. We confessed um, our own sins and struggles to one another. We forgave each other. We anointed each other with oil, anointed the whole house with oil, and gave the situation to God and asked him to change his mind, to change the circumstances, to change our atmosphere. And he did. And she cried out to him, and he stepped in. She said, it felt like God grabbed her and kicked away the evil that was trying to attack her. She said it literally felt like he grabbed her and kicked it away from her. It was the first time she had felt peace in years. And then she went into her room and started worshiping and singing a worship song. And she said it was the first night that she was able to sleep in peace in years because she cried out to him. She gave it up to him. We gave it up to him. We weren't trying to hold on to it and fix it ourselves, and neither was she. That's a personal example. But we have tons of these examples. Sometimes we don't take them literally. You know, we got to take these literally. It is the absolute word of God. It's the truth. There's nothing more true than what lies in here. So I just ask you right now, if you have something going on in your life where you need God to change his mind. You need God to change your atmosphere. You need God to change the things that are going on in your life. Then don't hesitate. Ask. Ask. It says if you're sick, come to the elders of the church. Ask them to lay hands on you. Anoint you with oil and you will be healed. Ask and you will receive. So I ask you, if you're dealing with something, please, Please come up and ask. We are here to be a family with you. We are here to stand in prayer with you. We are here to watch you overcome where you need overcoming. We're here to walk through it with you, no matter what it is. Even if you feel like that that it's shameful, believe me, (laughs) I've needed help with some really shameful stuff. But God and his grace and his love and his mercy poured out his blood, shed his blood to forgive me and to forgive you. There's nothing you haven't done that will separate you from the love of God. Nothing. So, if you don't know God, if you don't have a personal relationship with him, I ask you to come up here and meet with us We're getting ready to play some music and uh, play a worship song. I encourage you to stay and enter into worship. I encourage you to let go and let God and his love just flow over you. Worship God in his awesome, mighty wonder.